If you want to pay for unproven potions and use them in the privacy of your own home, all well and good. But such is the power of the alternative medical lobby that one seemingly bizarre remedy has become embedded in our National Health Service. Now I want to find out why we're all paying tax to fund other people's gullibility. I agree there is a plausibility problem, you know, and I pinch myself from time to time. I quite regularly pinch myself. You know, is this really happening? It's the hottest alternative health fad. It boasts an impressively vast and well-stocked medical cabinet. It's endorsed by royalty and the stars and is doing a booming trade in high street pharmacies. 500 million people worldwide claim to use it. What is it? It's a system for dosing up on a dilute solution of water. Welcome to the bizarre world of homeopathy. Homeopathy was dreamed up in the late 18th century as a way of boosting the body's vital spirit. One of the central tenets handed down by its founder, Samuel Hahnemann, was that like cures like. Superficially, this might sound faintly plausible, but unlike a vaccine that introduces a diminished form of a virus into the body in order to provoke its immune system, like cures like makes the unfounded assumption that what causes similar symptoms can cure those symptoms. In Hahnemann's world, dilute poison ivy cures skin rash because, undiluted, it causes a rash if touched. By the same principle, red onion can alleviate streaming eyes and snake venom stiffness. But amazingly, homeopathy gets even stranger still. Homeopaths claim that the more you dilute an active ingredient in water, the stronger medicine it becomes. Most homeopathic remedies are marked 30C. What does that mean? It means one part medicine to a hundred to the power of 30 parts water. How much? A drop in a fish tank? No. A fish tank is nowhere near big enough. A swimming pool doesn't provide enough dilution. Not even a lake. What about a drop in the ocean? But it turns out that even the sea isn't big enough. For the really approved homeopathic recipes, in order to get one molecule of the active substance, you need to imbibe all the atoms in the solar system. To science, it just doesn't make sense. Even homeopaths acknowledge that there is not a single molecule of active ingredient in the bottle they sell you. It's just water. So how can it possibly work? In an attempt to resolve the paradox, homeopathy boldly paddles further up the creek of pseudoscience, claiming that water somehow has a memory of the now completely absent active ingredient. But wouldn't water also have memory of other, more common impurities it's come into contact with? Salt, urine. Scientists have calculated that in each glass of water we drink, at least one molecule has passed through the bladder of Oliver Cromwell. Incredibly, you and I are paying for this unproven industry through our taxes. Despite the National Health Service's net £540 million deficit for 2006, the refurbishment of the Royal Homeopathic Hospital was part funded by the NHS to the tune of £10 million. That's equivalent to 500 nurses' salaries. Right here on the floor, here's a point to illustrate. Wooden floors, very unusual in a modern health care facility. This hospital was only completed 18 months ago. 
So this is our main clinical area. The homeopathic profession is unregulated by government. You can call yourself a homeopath without any qualification, training, or even insurance. After all, all you're doing is dishing out water solution. But Peter Fisher, clinical director of the hospital, is a medically trained rheumatologist. I see Prince Charles over there. Yep. Oh, yes, great friend of ours. <laughs> <laughs> These are the, the homeopathic medicines that are in you know, daily use. This is one, you know, for instance, it has quite a strong evidence base, Rostock, which is poison ivy. Right, OK. I want to know how someone highly qualified in real medicine can make such a leap of faith. I agree there is a plausibility problem, you know, and I pinch myself from time to time. I quite regularly pinch myself. You know, is this really happening? You know, the fact is I couldn't stop what I do now, even if I wanted to. My patients wouldn't let me. They say it helps. So how are things? Well, very much better since we last saw you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I virtually no pain at all. You know, if I'm aware of the symptoms are going to start again, I start taking it again and, and I can feel the improvement and then mm -hmm. I'll go back to it until I need it again, you know. Good. Oh, well, that's pretty straightforward. We just bash on the same, don't we? Yeah. I'm still taking the remedies, but you said to me, um, you know, if you get mini, if you get little reactions, mm. just hold off taking the remedies until they then uh, yeah. subside. So therefore, I've been doing that. So, for example, I haven't had a remedy for a week now. And uh, last time we met, you said you were getting a bit of an emotional sort of upset yeah. the day after you took the, the medicine. It was the day after I took the medicine. That I was impressed by the amount of time and care Peter Fisher devotes to each patient, far more than an ordinary doctor. Um, but in terms of the treatment, I would be you know, reluctant to make a big change. I think this is the right stuff and we may need to fiddle around with it. Like a GP, Peter Fisher prescribes medicine. But in this case, the medicine is a bit of a surprise. Thank you very much. Good. Common salt, natrium muriatic and sodium chloride, again in an ultramolecular dilution. I mean, obviously, since it's common salt, I mean, she's obviously taking in a hell of a lot of common salt anyway. Yes, oh, sure. Um, how, do, how does the one... Uh, <laughs> well, the truth is nobody knows. I don't know, nor does anybody else. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, the question is, do you think that because we don't know, because it seems implausible, it can't work? And that may be where you and I differ. That's Actually, right. the most recent problem was your skin, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, my hands, they've cleared up quite well. Um, my scalp's in, yeah. a lot, lot better. While patients like these provide positive anecdotes for homeopathy, subjective stories are not enough for science. I want to pin down precisely what double-blind trials have been conducted. Over a hundred have been done, some by me. On the whole, they're positive. And I, you know, I, I worked hard on it. Um, but in the face of great scepticism, in the face of many people who say, oh, well, yeah, we're not going to fund homeopathy, it's got to be a load of rubbish. Why do you think they say that if there really are controlled trials which, which show... Well, I think you're, you're, you're a much better place to comment on because you're the sort of person who says that. Well, because I, I have read studies which have sort of meta-analyses and things which suggest that, yes, occasionally there's a slight suggestion of something, maybe a slight suggestion there, but if you take the, all the studies that have been done, it doesn't add up in the way that... Oh, I, I don't ag agree with that at all. Now, if a double-blind controlled trial really does show that it works, then that suggests we're dealing with an entirely new force of physics, something unknown to science. Well, I think there's a slight exaggeration. I mean, there are, there are various hypotheses. Remarkably, nobody knows what the structure of liquid water is. So there is, there is room, you know, for, for a phenomenon analogous to, I'm not saying the same, but analogous to the storage of information by a magnetic medium, by a floppy disk or a video tape. Yes. If I were a doctor doing what you do and was convinced that it really worked, I would, I would drop everything and really, really try to demonstrate it and, and win the Nobel Prize for physics. I and mean, it would be an astonishing, totally astonishing uh, finding. That's, uh, to be honest, one of the main reasons I got into it. Plain ambition got me into it in the first place. But I agree, it would be nice to see, you know, a really serious program of research done, done on it. Well, it, you're saying it has been done and... Well, no, I'm saying that quite a lot of research ha has been done it's, I don't claim it's conclusive. Well, why, why not? I mean, it sounds as though... Well, because it's very diffuse. And, of course, it does depend what question you're asking. You know, are you saying, does it benefit people? Do people feel better? And I think, actually, there's, there's no doubt about that, that people who, who go to homeopathic hospitals who have homeopathic treatment do feel better. But, of course, you will say that's all because you're nice to them. This is all rather contradictory, so let's be clear about the latest evidence. In 2005, the medical journal The Lancet surveyed all the meta-analyses, the analyses of the analyses, 
and failed to find any reliable effect of homeopathy. Tellingly, for me, in the bigger trials, less prone to chance anomalies, homeopathy was more likely to show zero demonstrable effect. And yet, despite the lack of robust evidence, homeopathy thrives. Many clinicians look on in horror at the unlevel playing field of trials and evidence for medical licensing. In 2004, American trials seemed to show that the drug Herceptin could halve the death rate for a particularly virulent form of breast cancer. This was a major breakthrough. Patients understandably clamored for the new drug, but unlike in the world of homeopathy, the claims of scientific medicine are tested rigorously, and that takes time. Accordingly, the license was delayed. We went through a period of a year or two when Herceptin quite rightly, in my opinion, uh, was held up for the treatment of breast cancer until all the evidence was there. So we had extremely rigid cost-effectiveness analysis before we could use Herceptin. And, OK, there was a short passage of time when it seemed unfair. But you compare that when actually lives are lost because we're talking about life-threatening disease with drugs which actually save lives to the way that ineffective, irrational remedies are just being nodded through. I mean, it makes you weep. The pharmaceutical industry takes a lot of knocks. And yes, drugs are very expensive. But the reason they're so expensive is there may be 20 years of R&D to get to an effective product. Every step of the way is checked and double-checked. And now, through the back door, we're getting a class of compound being allowed into the marketplace with a license, with no such evidence of efficacy. I can't understand how you could even... But if homeopathy isn't tested properly or flunks its trials, then why do homeopaths remain popular? A lot of them owe their success, not to the homeopathy, but to the fact they are decent people. They have time, they're compassionate, they look the patient in the eye, they talk to someone for an hour. These are nice people. I would like to recruit these really nice people to practice proper medicine. And then in the end, what we've got are proper doctors, empathetic doctors, who will, in addition to the placebo effect of being that kind of physician, they can also add in truly effective drugs. Clinical trials show that homeopathy simply cannot match up with safe chemical drugs. Yet in the realm of petty ailments like sore eyes or itchy scalp, homeopathy is probably innocent enough. Because it's really all about attentive doctors spending time listening to the patient. That one is still, the right one is still a tiny bit puffy, isn't it? Or is it? Not? Well, it's always like that. Then giving them something that makes them feel better, precisely because it's supposed to make them feel better. I think it's all down to the placebo effect. I want to find out if that's the key to alternative medicine's grip on public confidence. I would disagree with you that I think something is being done. And why are we so good at placebo and the orthodox medicine is oh, not? Oh, well, they're, they're pretty good at it too. Alternative health remedies are swamping us. We've seen how most are not properly tested, how they undermine science and delude the public. <laughs>